All right, now we've moved on to heuristics. Now, many of the problem-solving issues that we face on a daily basis, uh, we solve, without even realizing it, we solve them with heuristics, which are simple strategies that work very quickly, and they're usually successful. Now, heuristics are especially useful when there isn't a clear uh, formula, there isn't a clear way to go about solving the problem. So let's say, for example, you uh, need to go to the grocery store to pick up a bag of carrots. That's why I have this little picture right here. Now, you could follow a very labor-intensive algorithm, uh, in which case you would get into the store, immediately go to one side, and walk up and down each aisle. And as you're in an aisle, you'll look from the top of the shelf down to the bottom of the shelf. So if you did that, you would absolutely find the carrots. However, it would take a really long time. So instead, we follow some simple heuristics when we're shopping. Where are the carrots going to be? Well, the odds are they're going to be either on the far left or the far right of the store because they're going to be on the outside. That's where the air, uh, refrigeration is. And you know that they're going to be near the other vegetables. Um, and so you follow these just simple strategies to get to the carrots really quickly. You can say I also have a picture of restrooms. Well, it's a similar thing. You want to find the restrooms in a restaurant. Well, you could go up and down near each wall in order to find it, but most of us use a simple heuristic. First we look by the host stand, then we look back by the kitchen. Uh, that's a really easy strategy. I want to now focus on two particular heuristics that I do want you to know more about. The first one is known as the representativeness heuristic. So according to this, um, we tend to judge how likely something is to be true based upon how representative it is of a particular category. So let's read this um, description right here of Jack. So married with four children, uh, generally conservative in his nature, he's very careful and ambitious, he shows no interest in political and social issues, most of his free time he spends on hobbies, uh, particularly home carpentry, sailing, and mathematical puzzles. Now, let's say you met this guy and you uh, wanted to decide what kind of career he was engaged with. And let's say you know your, your husband said, oh yeah, I can't remember if Jack is an engineer or a lawyer. I know it's one of those two. So using your representative niche heuristic, you would think, okay, based upon my prototype of what a lawyer looks like and my prototype of what an engineer looks like, I think he's more like the engineer. He, is, he likes carpentry, he likes math, he's really not interested in political issues, so he's not similar to my prototype of a lawyer, so I'm going to assign him to the engineer category. And the thing is, most of the time, we will be correct. But now I want to introduce uh, an additional point into the problem. Okay, so let's take it away from the sort of party example, and now we're back into just a, a problem-solving situation. And I tell you, Jack was selected at random from a group of 100 people. 70 of those people were lawyers, and 30 of those people were engineers. With that information, does that change your idea of whether Jack was a lawyer or an engineer? Now, quite often when people get this um, piece of information, they say that no, this doesn't change their idea at all. They are still convinced that Jack is most likely an engineer. And if you're answering that way, you're falling victim to something known as base rate neglect. Now, with base rate neglect, what that means is that we tend to ignore um, basic probabilities. We would be ignoring the fact that 70% of the people in this sample were lawyers. So just based upon that base rate, based upon the odds, Jack is probably a lawyer. 70% of the people in that group were lawyers, so therefore Jack is probably a lawyer. But we ignore that. We engage in base rate neglect. Um, and to give you another example, let's say you meet a woman uh, her name's Bianca. She's about five foot eleven. She's blonde, um, very shapely. She is uh, just strikingly attractive. She has a lovely walk. She's very well spoken. And I ask you, do you think Bianca is a model, or do you think she's a teacher? Well, the description that I gave you is pretty representative of at least my prototype for a model, and so we might tend to think that Bianca is a model. 
However, to do that would be ignoring the general odds or the base rate of how many people, especially in Lancaster County, are teachers versus how many people are models. So the odds are very strong that this woman is a teacher. However, because she's so similar or representative of our idea of models, we tend to get pulled incorrectly in that direction. Okay, now before I get into this next heuristic, um, I want you to just play a little game with me. And I want you to think about which is the more likely cause of death, lung cancer or car accident? Go and humor me, take a guess here. Lung cancer or car accident? And then which do you think is more common, emphysema or homicides, a more common cause of death? Emphysema or homicides? And then the final pair that I want you to think about is being which is the more common cause of death, tuberculosis or fire? Okay, now these particular pairs uh, were shown to a number of people who were participating in a research study, and they tended to choose that car accident was the more common cause for that top pair, that homicides were more common in this middle pair, and that fire was more common down here. And whenever I've done this in class, my students tend to fall along the same lines as the people in the research study. Now, the reason for that, most likely, is that we hear a lot more about car accidents, people dying in those, than we do about people dying from lung cancer. We certainly hear a lot more about people dying from homicides than we do dying from emphysema. And most definitely, there's a huge difference down here in terms of what, how much we hear about. So according to the availability heuristic, the more easily something comes to mind, um, the more available it is, uh, the more likely we are to judge that as being the true, most common thing. All right, so now let's look at the actual statistics of causes of death. What we see here is a staggering difference. Far more people have died from lung cancer than car accidents. And yet, most people choose car accidents as the more likely cause of death. Now if we look over to this third piece of information, the media reports per year, we can see why. There are far more media reports for the car accident than there are for lung cancer as a cause of death. And so therefore, that's going to be much more available to us. It gets brought to mind very, very easily. And so therefore, we judge car accident as being a lot more likely. We see a similar thing going on between homicides and emphysema. Much more media attention to homicides, and so therefore more people choose that as a cause of death, even though it is slightly less likely than emphysema. Now in this bottom example, the availability heuristic actually proves to be useful to us. We get a lot more uh, reports of people dying in fires than people dying in tuberculosis, and sure enough, it is a more common cause of death. So the availability heuristic is usually true. The more easily something comes to mind, the more likely it probably is. And in fact, there was a study done uh, on people's ability to predict who is going to win the NCAA tournament. And they compared novices to people who really kept track of statistics with uh, college basketball. What they found was that the novices were correct almost as often as the experts. And it was thought that that's because the novices were heavily relying on the availability heuristic. Which college teams tended to come to mind as being strong basketball players? Um, and so if we do that, I mean, I don't know anything, but I would guess Duke, Connecticut, Kentucky, uh, Georgetown, UNC, these are the basketball teams that come to mind really easily. And indeed, those are the ones who do tend to be in the Final Four more often than other schools. And so that case, the availability heuristic would be beneficial to me. Okay, now I want to move on to the power of framing effects and how these impact our decision making. So before I really explain the concept, I want to just present you with this information from a research study. Now, in a particular uh, university, all of the graduate students uh, were divided into groups. And so in one group, they received a notice that if they registered for classes before October 1st, they would earn a 3% discount on their tuition. The other half of the students were sent to notice that if they failed to register for classes before October 1st, they, October 1st, they would have to pay a 3% penalty. Now my question for you is which frame of the decision do you think would be more motivating to you? 
Well, if you are like the graduate students, you probably found the penalty option to be far more motivating. If we look at this data here, 93% of the graduate students registered early if they got the penalty notice, whereas only 67% registered early when they got the discount notice. And in this situation, the amount that they actually paid before or after Oktoberfest was this October 1st was the same thing. And yet far more people were motivated by the frame uh, of losing something. And so this is the example of the framing effect. The way we frame the problem, the way we word it, has a big impact on people's behavior. And the general finding that we get is that people are far more motivated by the pain of a loss than they are by the pleasure of an equivalent gain. So let me give you another example. Let's say you were walking with some friends to lunch. You had $5 in your pocket to buy lunch. You get up to actually pay the cashier and you put your hand in your pocket and you realize that $5 is gone. Okay, I want you to imagine the emotion that you feel, the intensity of the emotion that you feel by having lost $5 that you thought was in your pocket. Now let's compare that to another scenario. You are walking to lunch and on the sidewalk in front of you, you see a $5 bill and you pick up the five dollar bill and you put it into your pocket and I want you to think about how much pleasure you would have by the gain of that five dollars and therefore having more money to spend on your lunch. Well most folks tend to be much more emotional about losing the five dollars than they are emotional about gaining five dollars and so many many examples have shown that when you frame a decision or you frame a problem and really emphasize the loss you actually have more motivation and we see this quite often on commercials or messages to try to change people's health behaviors like smoking so many commercials will focus on the loss that you will have if you don't stop smoking you know the wrinkles the cancer the increased risk of uh, emphysema, the damage to your children, all of those are focusing on what you will lose if you fail to stop smoking. And that's because the motivation for most people tends to be far more powerful. Now, the final thing that I want to address with regards to decision making is something known as the sunk cost fallacy. And that is that we tend to make our decisions very much based upon how much time or money or energy we have already invested in something. So imagine that you have gone to a movie, you paid $10 to get into that movie, and it turns out within about a half an hour you've realized you absolutely hate this movie. Would you leave or not? And there are a number of people who would say that they wouldn't leave simply because they had already invested that much money. And so in essence, we are making ourselves miserable we're sticking with something that isn't very effective. It could potentially be downright problematic um, simply because we've already invested money into it. Another example would be, let's say you're in a relationship and you've been in that relationship for five years and for the last two, you guys have been making each other absolutely miserable. Quite often, people will consider staying simply because they've already invested so much time. And the idea here is that uh, we don't want to lose that time and if we simply abandon the movie or abandon the relationship or a bad book or a bad job it would be as if that was completely wasted but I point out to you another way of thinking about it you know let's say we go to that movie do you want to spend ten dollars and be miserable for the next hour and a half or would you rather spend ten dollars and maybe go out and take a walk or go get a cup of coffee with your friend and talk instead either way you've spent that ten dollars it's gone one way to overcome the sunk cost fallacy is to simply remind yourself that that investment is gone do you want to spend the time after that investment being happy or being miserable and so if you know the last two years of a relationship have been bad do you want to continue and have the next ten years of your life be miserable or do you want the ten years of your next ten years of your life to be a little bit better so this is one way to think about the sunk cost fallacy and to try to avoid falling victim to it. All right, that's it for this video.